I'm here to talk to you about a, a dialectic between um, genomics and phenomenology, but you know, Olga already hinted at a, a, a deeper one, which I won't talk very much about today, which is that between the quants and medicine. And every time I used to go between my MD training on one side of the river and then my PhD training on the other side of the river, the cultural and conceptual divide was so deep that even beginning to have a conversation that both parties would understand was a huge effort. And it's actually a real pleasure that we're, we've developed uh, a generation now of leaders, such as Olga, such as my colleague uh, Atul Butte, who can speak uh, both languages fluently. Without that uh, bilingualism across quantitative reasoning and medicine, the hope to actually uh, accelerate uh, medicine's uh, entry into a more data-driven age is, I think, a lost one. But I'm very optimistic because of this new generation. So, yes, um, in the remaining uh, 45 minutes or 43 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about this dialectic between genomics and phenomenology. And I think it's an important one that we need to address because often, just as the, the divide between uh, me clinical medicine and uh, molecular biology, uh, the divide between phenomenology and genomics, I think, has slowed down um, progress and has resulted, actually, in... Um, frankly, diagnostic categories that hurt patients as well as slow down progress. And I'll try to, to make uh, that uh, clear to you. So, oh, by the way, um, Olga tells me that she's tracking the audience so that if you, um, if you have questions, uh, she's going to uh, interrupt me or help you interrupt me. So what is a dialectic? Uh, it's simply a dialogue. And, but without, hopefully, the emotional appeal uh, or the modern uh, pejorative sense of rhetoric, rhetoric. And very specifically, I mean, talking about dialectic in the uh, perhaps uh, Marxist material dialectic sense, where you go from thesis to antithesis and then get to a synthesis, um, just as we, um, according to some, moved that ladder from patricians to plebeians to through the lords all the way to um, Bitcoin traders. Um, so what is the corresponding uh, genome-phenome uh, discovery dialect? It all started with phenomenology. And some of the phenomenology was a little bit uh, arcane, like phrenology, bumps on your head. And some of it was just very good observations, clinical observations. And it started around when, into the 19th and 20th century, when heritability, the notions of heritability and inheritance of some genetic factors, even without understanding what the, where those genetic factors were, were um, being developed, that uh, the, there was a really productive um, collaboration between the phenomenologists using family-based observations to make genetic discoveries. And this, of course, accelerated hugely with the Human Genome Project and genome-wide studies. And the reaction to those led to uh, these genome-wide studies, especially around some of the common variants, led to some skepticism, perhaps because in every um, turn of the dialectic, there's always been, of necessity almost, a overselling, a hype of the, uh, of the thesis so that, for example, if you listened literally to the claims being made of the Human Genome Project uh, 10 years ago, we would have solved many of the problems of medicine. Of course, what it did, it was created a very useful map and, and a set of tools for exploring that map. Uh, but nonetheless, because of that, when uh, it turned out that a lot of the uh, variants um, were not that were being discovered were not moving things forward in quite the speed. There was some skepticism being generated, and the omnigenic hypothesis, which we'll get to, also started uh, making uh, some skeptical. But I think that those of us who have been around uh, long enough and can speak the language of genomics and of uh, cl uh, clinical phenomenology do see that the way forward is to integrate these two. And uh, I just learned from Olga that there's a new Precision Medicine Institute 
or, or, or effort at Princeton, and there's many such efforts that are uh, cropping up around the country, and I think it's being led by people who understand that we have to do this integration. And, but I will try to put more meat on that. So first of all, there were the phenotype first studies. And the phenotype first studies, um, for example, what was this paper um, coming out in 1943, a pedigree of mental defect showing sex linkage. And forgive me for the impolitic language that was quite standard back in 1943. And it's uh, the following history of imbecility in 11 males of two generations were brought to our notice some years ago. And they basically built this big family tree. And they reported what ended up being fragile X. Fragile X, the disease. And they defined it based on just the family, tr the family tree and the uh, segregation within the family tree. And uh, it took another 50 years for um, the FMR1 gene on the X chromosome that's associated with Fragile X to be identified. That's 50 years. That's a long time. Things accelerated a lot faster than when we had access to genome scale sequencing methods. And there were, using the pipelines that were developed uh, through the Human Genome Project, we had spectacular successes. So here's just an example of one paper that was published, many of which were published with the support of the uh, Simons uh, Foundation, showing multiple loci that were associated with um, autism. And at the time, I remember, because uh, I had the privilege of uh, I think, yeah, I think I was funded for a little while by the Simons Foundation. I was at some meetings, and people were crowing about how many um, loci or genes had been implicated in autism. And I heard 700 and 800. And I started saying, it's maybe 20,000 genes. If we implicate 1,000 genes in autism, what does it mean in terms of being a disease? It sounds more like some perturbation of life or biology more generally than a specific disease. And at the same time, I was having some broader thoughts about the risks of a genome first and genome only approach to medicine. So with my colleagues Russ Altman and Dan Macy's, I wrote this paper in um, the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2006 where I, it was based on a three-line program I wrote in R, just showing how many false positives I would have in a population if I had 100% sensitivity and 99.99% specificity, better than any genetic test we've ever had. And what I said was, look, just with 10,000 parallel tests, and of course we can do a million on a gene chip, and many more than that with whole genome sequence, 60% of the United States population would be falsely positive, falsely positive, diagnosed with a disease when that they don't have with these unbelievable individual test performance. And I said that's very problematic because, of course, what will happen, there'll be a bunch of patients who are going to be worried. Let's say we don't care about patients. There'll be a bunch of doctors who will be ordering a bunch of tests, and they'll be discomfited. But we don't care about doctors. But then there'll be a whole bunch of bills that arrive to the insurance companies, to the insurance companies for all those follow-on tests. And then they'll say, not only are we not going to pay for genomic tests, we're not going to pay for those follow-on tests. And that would be the end of genomic medicine. That was my warning. And I coined this term, the incidental ohm which I said back then would be the biggest ohm of them all, growing faster than all, and, I, and, they, and it has. And it's not just a technical issue. It's a biological issue. There is a disease called, disease called a hereditary hemochromatosis. It's an iron deposition disease. And uh, people die of it. Uh, and it's caused, caused multi-organ failure, including heart failure. And if you go to a hereditary hemochromatosis clinic, 80% of the 
of individuals in that clinic have mutations in a gene called HFE. So quite reasonably, uh, Ernest Boitler and colleagues uh, genotyped um, on the order of 41,000 individuals in the Kaiser Clinic, so consecutively unbiased view. And sure enough, they found a whole bunch, 150, I believe, who were homozygous for HFE mutations. But less than 1% of those patients had any clinical evidence of hemochromatosis. So how do you go, because think about what we're seeing in autism, and now think about this more broadly. How do we go from hereditary hemochromatosis clinic, 80% probability of HFE mutation, given hereditary hemochromatosis, is 80%. This is the other probability. This is a probability of hemochromatosis, given the genetic variant, less than 1%. Anybody have an idea why this is happening? What? Rare. Rare is not the answer. Not a single joint is getting close. Any other ideas? OK. Good enough. Genetic background. So because when it's hereditary hemochromatosis, it's happened in that individual. They share a genetic background. It's, re it's in a family. Whereas when it's in the outbred population that you look sequentially, they don't share a genetic background. Furthermore, what else do they share? Environment. So um, these are three mouse strains. And the gene is knocked out in three of these mouse strains. Only in one of three mouse strains. These are not different species, just different strains of mice. In only one in three strains is there hemochromatosis when you knock out that gene. What's different between them? Genetic background. Sadly, and of course the French would study this, uh, the more wine you drink, the higher the penetrance of the variants because that's affecting your environment. It's affecting your liver. And so these are two important factors. The uh, genetic background and the environmental background that we do not systematically measure and that we forget about when we flip from P of uh, variant given disease in the clinic to P of disease given variant. Follow me? All right. So I, I, I am an MD PhD type. I got my PhD in uh, computer science in the 1980s during the second heyday of. Um, artificial intelligence. We're now in the third heyday. Um, and I was trained in the 1980s as well, clinically. And so there was a, a big uh, breakthrough that happened in the 80s. So there are these monogenic causes of genetic, of growth hormone deficiency. And some of them are genetic, some of them are due to tumors. Um, and what we used to do is we would grind up the pituitaries of dead bodies, and like 60,000 dead bodies of the pituitaries, and then this precious resource, growth hormone, that we extracted out of it, was given throughout the world. This was done by my mentors. It was not uh, uh, during, happening during my time. Unfortunately, what happened then was in the mix of the 60,000 pituitaries were some that had, were from brains of people who had slow virus, had Kuro disease, Jacob, sorry, ja 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 Jakob Kreutzfeld disease. And so as a result, several children got infected and died of slow virus. So this was horrifying to the pediatric endocrinologists who had intervened admittedly on an important disease, extreme short stature, but not death. And now they're getting, they were killing these patients. And so as a result, um, it was a great result when um, we were able to develop recombinant growth hormone, growth hormone, uh, human growth hormone coming out of uh, synthesis by E. coli. So there was no chance of contamination. And that was wonderful, and Genentech made a whole bunch of uh, money uh, because they were charging on the order of, of 10 to $30,000 a year 
uh, for uh, for the for growth hormone. Parenthetically, because I sh because my mentors had been used to uh, giving tiny doses uh, because of the pituitary uh, extract, I was taught to give about a third of the dose that was recommended by Genentech. And I was able to show, compared to national standards, that um, our growth rates were just as good. And then I published an abstract about this. And I got a personal call from Ann Johansson, who was then the chief scientific officer of, uh, of uh, Genentech. And she says, Dr. Kohani, do you realize that I sit on the editorial board of all the pediatric endocrine uh, journals? And she wanted me to withdraw the article, and I didn't. But uh, that is a story for another day. Another thing that happened, though, is that treating growth hormone deficient individuals is a small population. What really do you, if you're a Genentech, what do you really want to do? You want to treat everyone who's short. And so they, de they developed a new disease, idiopathic short stature. And turns out, if you give super physiological amounts of growth hormone, for some kids, you can add an inch or two. And that's after giving them tens of thousands of dollars worth of daily injections for years. So that's a diagnostic category that sort of has been created just to, to increase income. And it's not such a surprise that it doesn't work that well, because as, done, as a recent study shown by my, one of my former fellows in, in endocrinology, Joel Hirshhorn, who runs the um, giant study, this was a study of five million individuals, five million individuals. And what they found was that about 20% of the genome contributed to the height. So we're talking about 20% of the genome affects height. Now, that means every single locus has a really small contribution. And it's very much, very similar to our question about autism. So height is, as it varies continuously, is not a disease of a single gene. It's an interplay across a large number of genes. So it's not, it doesn't look very much like a disorder if it's a continuous trait like that. This is probably true for the genetic architecture of many common diseases. A big part of them will have this, have lichen growth hormone disorder, some very penetrant monogenic hits, and a great deal of um, polygenic uh, continuous influences. My colleague, uh, Sharad Patel, in our department, did a study with um, a big database that had nothing to do with genetics, just claims data from an insurance company from Aetna. And what's interesting about this, this appeared in Nature Genetics. So this is a Nature Genetics paper without a single gene in it. And what he did is he used uh, the data from uh, 45 million individuals in this claims database. And of those 45 million individuals, there were 56,000 twins. And because some twins were same sex and others were different sex, you could actually estimate could put upper bounds on heritability for these individuals. And so across 500 diseases, he was able to estimate heritability and the environmental causes of, or the environmental component of um, these diseases. Now, it's interesting to see that, sure enough, in terms of heritability, ADHD and pervasive developmental, developmental disorder that the uh, Simons Foundation cares a lot about it is high up there on the uh, heritability uh, axis. But there are many other diseases for which heritability is much lower, and that, for example, social economic status is a major uh, player. Pointer, 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 pointer. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So yes, so what you see here is um, social econ uh, economic status is a, a, a much more uh, larger component. The 
Truth be told, though, unlike the human genome, we don't know what the environment, environment looks like. And so this, although this is a, looks like a big component, it's actually the minority of the uh, environmental component. Looking at temperature, looking at pollution, all the factors that we know how to enumerate in these uh, individuals, we could only account for a minority of the environmental variation. So that's a huge um, uh, unmet, unmet uh, measurement need. So for example, what's not being measured? Diet, exercise. So back to autism. I had this crazy idea around, I think, 2006, which now makes a bit more sense that I was going to measure the differences between kids with a diagnosis of autism and those who are neurotypical by looking at peripheral blood. And I'm not going to go into the science of this because it's just a lead up for another point I want to make. But we were able to show adequate but not great performance, AUCs around on a good day, 0 0.7, 0 0.75, to distinguish, uh, to distinguish um, autism from uh, neurotypical individuals. But the reason I bring it up is because of this publication, I was invited to a Harvard Law School meeting uh, across the river. And so I always love going to different schools at Harvard University. It's so big that it's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to meet other people. And then when I um, walked in the door into the meeting room, which was a small intimate meeting room with about 10 people there, I saw this individual. And I said, I think I remember seeing this guy on a television in a hotel room just a few weeks ago. And as he started talking, I realized I had seen him on CNN. This guy is Ari, Ari Neman. And he, uh, much as uh, Agent Smith talking to uh, Neo in uh, The Matrix, he goes to me, Dr. Kohane, why is it that you want to commit genocide on my people? So having lost a few, uh, quite a few relatives in the, in the Holocaust, I don't take kindly, even from an Israeli, uh, to be uh, accused of committing genocide on anybody. But um, what was he talking about? He, was talking, he thought that I was proposing a test that could be used to basically abort uh, children, which is not, a, not at all the case. Uh, but that would therefore remove uh, individuals with autism from, uh, from the human species. And that was not at all what I was thinking. But when I thought about that, I said, it's a very strange thing that he's saying because autism encompasses a fairly large mix of individuals. And it's much better for you to hear what, not what I said told Ari, which may be unprintable, to what a mother of a child with autism said on the, that I picked up on the web. She said, I think when Ari talks about autism and I talk about autism, we're talking about people with different clusters of autism. I know he doesn't like the word cure. If my daughter could function the way Ari could, I would consider her cured, says Singer. I have to believe my daughter doesn't want to be spending time peeling skin off her arm. And I want you to think of what a tragedy it is that we have a disease diagnosis that can, encompasses everybody from Ari Neman, a high-functioning, very public individual, to someone who cannot speak and is not comfortable every day of, of their life. And there are many uh, reasons. It's not an accident that it's happened. There are big uh, moneyed interests uh, to push that broad diagnosis, but it helps no one. It's, it is as if uh, when you went to the doctor and you said, um, I'm feeling tired, what do you have? And he says, you have dropsy. Well, what's dropsy? Dropsy is accumulation of fluids throughout your body, which is due to many different processes from heart disease to kidney disease to liver disease. And even within uh, uh, heart disease, this right side of heart failure, left heart disease, heart failure, valvular disease, genetics disease, and so on. And all those are lumping all those into one diagnosis is, in fact, what the, the uh, term dropsy meant to a 17th century clinician. But autism is pretty much that level of, of sophistication. So when I looked at a large database, a large electronic health record database, um, 
I saw that there was a subgroup of kids with autism who had bowel problems. And some of them, in fact, had inflammatory bowel disease. So I went to a, the head of a very famous, and he's a super nice guy, uh, a very famous clinic, de developmental clinic. And I said, um, you know, I'm seeing this, uh, this problem with bowels. What do you think it is? And he said, Zach, it's very simple. And he said it in these words. He said, brain bad, tummy hurts. I said, that's a little, I said to myself, that's a little dismissive. And then I went to the GI doctors and they said, it's not, it's not, it's not the case. So I'm a persistent guy. And Finale Doshi, whose picture you saw, who's now, she was then a postdoc. She had just gotten her PhD at MIT, working on machine learning. And she uh, joined my lab as a postdoc. She's now a professor of computer science at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard. But I told her the story, and I said, can you look into an electronic health record and treat it as a machine learning problem to identify subgroups of patients? And she said, yep, she would. And she came up with a pretty ingenious thing. She looked at each patient as a row, and across the entirety of all the patients with autism in, these, in this big electronic health record database that we actually went across multiple hospitals, she gathered all the comorbidities. They were on the order of 5,000 comorbidities. So for each six-month block of life, next six months, next six months, so on, all the way to age 15, she would create a bit vector. So for each six-month block, there's a bit vector with 5,000 bits, each bit corresponding to whether or not that comorbidity exists for that patient. A one if the, the comorbidity exists, a zero if it doesn't. And she then did pretty straightforward clustering exercise to find which patients resembled each other and to create this agglomerate of clustering, which we published in uh, pediatrics. This was across several hospitals. And first, we, one group that we found was super enriched for seizures. Now, we all know about uh, seizures and autism, but this one group had on the order of 80% prevalence of seizures. That uh, prevalence rose steadily across the first years of life as shown on the x-axis. Then there was another subgroup that had infections, and a lot of infectious diseases, like otitis and pharyngitis and um, lung infections. Also, they had within the same group, although it can't, it's not shown because the prevalence is too low, but it was highly significant enrichment for inflammatory bowel disease, type 1 diabetes, and so this looks like an immunological subgroup, both uh, infections and um, autoimmune disease. And then there was a, sub, a third subgroup that looked very much overloaded with psychiatric diseases, neuropsychiatric diseases such as um, ADHD, anxiety, depression, and again, significant but not uh, prevalent enough to show on this graph, um, schizophrenia. And, but, and we got published in that. Frankly, there's many mothers who came to me. And I never, as a pediatric endocrinologist, I never got this reception that I got from these mothers in tears, thanking me for recognizing these um, phenotypic clusters that their pediatricians never recognized as part of the, of the disease. But the overall response by the pediatric, pediatric and, um, developmental specialists and the, and the GI group was that somehow that this was ascertainment. So instead, I went deep in, again into a, uh, into a insurance company. Insurance companies are very useful in this country because you may be able to run away from a hospital, so you have a very partial record, an electronic health record. But you, in this country, you can't run away from your bills. And so that if you have the billing codes, although they are distorted in their own ways, you have a good uh, denominator. And we were able to show that for inflammatory bowel disease, this was enriched significantly across all these three uh, different ascertainment methods. So what's the next step? So given the fact that we've had a lot of success with genetics, but there seems to be this phenomic 
a signal that has been ignored for too long, how we bring it together. Well, I think the next step in dialectic, dialectic is to think not more broadly, not just the um, electronic medical record, but all the different types of data that come into play. Google and Facebook know a lot of these data types about you, and they use it to target you, target you with ads. But I assure you that if you had my clone, and we had identical genetics, but if you knew that one of my clones had a fitness club membership and actually went to the fitness club, and that uh, another one of my clone was purchasing a lot of food, you could actually distinguish risks and uh, stratification of those two clones based on these kinds of data. So what, this is a, this is a graph that we, um, sorry, a diagram that we published in JAMA. I think that one of the uh, clear frontiers for precision medicine is not just to integrate genetics and um, the clinical record, which is just a fraction, the clinical record is just a fraction of a, of a view of your life as a human being, but to use these other data types with your permission, with the patient's permission, to actually access, to actually get a much more precise view of what the patient is. And I'll try to make that perhaps a little bit more um, concrete by telling you about a study that was done by one of my former students, now a professor at uh, Ben Gurion University, um, Alal Iran. And what she did is she took the precision medicine approach. And I, you'll hear precision medicine a lot from me because I happen to be on the National Academy of Science Committee that actually defined precision medicine in our report in 2011. And it was a, it was a privilege to be with President Obama when he declared the precision uh, medicine initiative. But because of being on that committee, I can tell you much more what we meant by it. What we meant by it was that just as Google provides, gets a lot more value out of longitude and latitude by layering different data types on top of each other for that same longitude and latitude, such as where your friends are, where your pharmacies are, where the, where the weather is and so on, and where the traffic is, we need to be able to do the same thing by layering multiple data types on top of each other. And including the genomics, including the environmental, including the um, behavioral. So we tried this in autism. And we tried using it, the existing data sets in a new integrative way. So thanks to the Simons Foundation, there are some very large repositories of whole exome sequencing, which provide a comprehensive uh, survey of functional variation through all these thousands of variants. And they include segregation patterns across families, extremely important uh, phenotypic ob observation. And so we are going to look for functional convergence across co-regulated exons, reg exons that are expressed at similar times of development and similar programs. And we were going to provide phenotypic specificity by specifying this unique phenotypic feature of autism, the four to one ratio between males and females, gender specific ex expression. So with these large cohorts, could we in fact do this integrative approach? Well, we started with a very important data set, which is the brain span data set, which is human fetus, and then uh, child, and then adult, expression patterns of the, of the brain through development, through aging, looking at different regions and looking at expression using RNA-seq. At that time, it was bulk RNA-seq. And we asked ourselves, which genes are the most different in their trajectory over that time between males and females, particularly during development. Which genes have the most difference? And so we found a, the set of genes and therefore exons which were the most different from each other during uh, neurodevelopment. And we took this uh, data set, again, 
from the SSC Total Recall Project, and we identified which of those that we knew segregated with that sexual difference, that sex difference that we just described, that phenotypic sex difference, which segregated with the disease, because there could be many other variants that did not segregate with the disease. And we then clustered those. And so this was clusters of neurodevelopmentally co-regulated, sexually dimorphic, dimorphic segregating deleterious variation. Feels like the New York Times describing uh, all the sins of Trump while they announce um, his new uh, candidacy, unfortunately. So what we did was we found a bunch of clusters. Some were well known, like immune function clusters, Krobman and the tin, transcriptional regulation, synaptic function, growth and morphogenesis. But a relatively new one and that, was, uh, that represented 20% of the signal was in lipid regulation. So we've done this genomics, gene expression, phenotypic integration, and we got into these subgroups and we find lipid regulation. So what are we going to do about that? And for example, one of the clusters is in the, the exons of lipoprotein lipase, a ubiquitous uh, enzyme. And so we looked at the entire pathway of uh, li uh, uh, metabolism of lipids from the reactome pathway. And you see here LPL towards the top of the screen, lipoprotein lipase. And we also found mutations in the LDL pathway and LDLR. So we have a hypothesis to test. How are we going to test the hypothesis that lipid dysregulation might be a convergent, a convergent, not all convergent, a convergent etiology in autism? So we looked at all the patients at Children's Hospital, and what we found was that across all the li lipid measurements, even when you removed all the patients with uh, lipid altering uh, drugs, all the patients with diabetes, you found, we found that there was a significant and increased uh, odds ratio of lipids, in both the LDL lipids and the triglycerides um, in these patients. And then we looked at, across this um, insurance database, and sure enough, we found the same thing. But we also found it to a lesser extent in the moms and the dads of these patients. So I think a reasonable question would be, so is there something weird happening with autism families that somehow they're eating poorly and they have this dyslipidemia as a result? Well, how are we going to answer that question? So we looked at all the families in the insurance database. And what's nice about insurance databases is they have families because families join when you're, when one of the partners, one of the parents joins a uh, employer, often the whole family gets um, enrolled into that insurance plan. And what we found is the unaffected SIB in the same family was much, had much more, a much lower rate of dyslipidemia, but the affected ones had a much higher rate. Hmm. So this is now across tens of thousands of uh, cases. And then when you look at a place like the Jackson Mouse Lab and look at all the dyslipidemia models of mouse, huge overlap with the autism phenotype. Many of these dyslipidemic mouses, mice, have autism phenotypes just as severe as any of the classical ones that you know, that you know of. And why is that? Well, it's not so surprising because lipids, fat, are not just a source of energy. They're key in human neurodevelopment. 60% of your brain is fat. So when someone tells you a fathead, they're right. And um, it's an essential uh, building block of cell membranes, neurons, astrocytes, myelin sheets, and it's crucial for maintaining neuronal excitability and synaptic function. It's also crucial for lipid signaling, like arachidonic acid and all the prostaglandins are derivatives of this. And so any small uh, 
uh, dysregulation of, of fat metabolism is for a subset of individuals going to cause a neurodevelopment disorder. So what is the next step in the dialectic? Uh, we're focusing on dyslipidemia because other groups are looking at the other clusters already. Well, there's been an increase in autism over the last 50 years. Some of it is certainly ascertainment bias. But some of it, could it be environmental? Could it be pollution? Could it be our diet? We're getting a lot fatter. Um, we already know that um, pregnancies with uh, obesity Already, the children are at significant risk for a variety of um, disorders, developmental disorders, including cardiac disorders. And I've seen a hint in one Danish study that there are more neurodevelopmental disorders in the children of mothers who have uh, obesity. So could this be one mechanism, perhaps? Also, for that subgroup, maybe we should be thinking about trials for high-risk dyslipidemic children. So if you have a parent and then a child that genetically seems to be a setup for a dyslipidemia, you could track it. And if the child shows early signs of uh, atypical neurodevelopment, you might consider something that we wouldn't consider otherwise, which is giving a statin or some other relatively benign drug to uh, change the lipid profile. And so I think this allows us, to, this gives us an example of how we can, might invert uh, group ascertainment and recruitment. Instead of going after children with autism, we should go after children with a certain integrated profile, children who have lipid disorders, children and neurodevelopment disorders, children who have immunological problems and this, uh, disorders. Lumping them into a, into a pack, doing a case control study around genetics with that very, very awful uh, wastebasket term, autism, is just adding noise to the system, and it's not bringing us into the 21st century at all. And I want to note that uh, I'm proud of one very small way we're, we're contributing to this um, increased phenotypic richness that we can add to this pr project. Back in 2009, I was horrified by the fact that the well-meaning uh, Obama administration, which was going to uh, invest in electronic health records, was actually investing in electronic health records that were state of the art for 1980, like Cerner and Epic, using pretty antiquated systems. And I said, at the same time the iPhone was coming out, why can't we have modular systems that are uh, efficient and where you can throw away things easily that are not um, working well? And as a result, we got a grant from uh, the government, and we created an API, an application programmer interface, called Smart on Fire. And Smart on Fire was adopted in two different ways. One is one of our, my colleagues, uh, Ricky Bloomfeld, who was a doctor at uh, Duke University, had implemented it on top of the Epic Health Record System. He became an Apple employee. Now, any of you who have an iPhone, there's a heart-shaped icon in it. Apple Health. And if you go to it, if you're one of the 800 and growing hospitals, if you're a patient at one of the 800 and growing hospitals that Apple has made a deal with, and it's right now it's 800 hospitals, it's going to be 2,000 hospitals in another five years. So now it's already 40 million Americans. You can look at your own entire health record in terms of labs, procedures, diagnoses, uh, demographics, medications, and actually donate your data for the first time ever without having to go through the healthcare system. And um, the other uh, driver has been in the 21st Century Cures Act, they specified that there needed to be an API so that you just wouldn't get a fax of your data, but they could go through an API to get the data uh, programmatically and in a digitally com computable fashion. And they actually, in the legislation of Congress, actually called out our specific interface, the Smart and Fire inter interface. And so we're actually working on, on how to have more popular-based phenotypic studies to merge them with uh, the uh, genomics to get a better view. So in summary, I think we need to revisit diagnosis as a concept that's based on really sound probabilistic reasoning 
rather than a bunch of guys sitting around a table deciding you know, what characteristics uh, are in a diagnosis where there's, a, there's horse trading and other agendas that don't actually meet the needs of patients. I think that a genetics first approach risks scientific myopia for understanding complex disease. On the other hand, a phenotypic first approach is helpful in getting the big picture, but it's missing the mechanistic insights. And so I do think we have to embrace a combination phenotype genetics approach, meeting in the middle of synthesis, which allows holistic uh, approach and focus towards all the disease that affect us. And this is a challenge in uh, multidisciplinary approaches. As Olga says, there are the, the, you know, the people who speak phenomics and those people who speak genomics often end up being very different communities. They don't speak to one another. So they have mutual contempt and they don't integrate well. And it's only when you have that integration that you see uh, forward movement. And there's also challenges in multimodal data acquisition, but those are, in fact, smaller challenges than um, the soci sociological ones. And I'll just end now, and forgive me for this in advance, with an advertisement. We have two junior faculty searches in AI and in um, bioinformatics. Boston's not such a, such a bad city, and uh, it's not as great a walking city as New York, but it's pretty nice. So thank you very much, and I'm glad to take any questions. Ask me, ah, there we go. Uh, you, you mentioned genome and phenome, like, uh, and there is a big gap between them, basically. So uh, there are other, like... Can you use your uh, seat, Mike, please? Could you push speak on your... Uh, for, for instance, uh, like uh, there are other uh, omics data, transcriptomic, metabolomics, uh, lipidomics, and uh, which are between these two entities. And the other thing that I want to ask you your comment about is that it's also the dynamics of, like, because a lot of processes uh, happens uh, in time and also space. And uh, what do you think about, like, uh, this gap from genome to phenome? You mentioned that uh, it's like looking at genome by itself or phenome by itself, uh, I mean, are not useful. Do you think it's a better approach to combine all of this together? So I think what you're saying is eminently sensible. And I don't think, rather than appealing to you computationally, I'll appeal, appeal to you from common sense. If you want to understand an individual, you want to be able to look at them at all resolutions and say, well, is, okay, maybe they're immunological. What kind of immunological defect is? Is it just in the peripheral blood, or is it in the spleen? Is it is the behavioral disorder constant, or does it change over time? And so, the more you, the more you, the more dimensions you can apply, the better precision you get. So, precision medicine. Some people, a lot of people, think that precision medicine. When we wrote that report from the National Academy, we didn't mean precise in that. It's, minute measurements of genomics. We meant intersection of multimodal uh, measurements. And so in the example I gave you that Alal did, we actually did use transcriptomics and the dynamics of the brain as one of the measures. So I think the more comprehensive we can look at it, the better off we, we will be. And speaking now as a computational uh, scientist, it's a crime to let data sets which are out there around us that are being used, again, by Google and others, to sell us, we should be using those effectively to characterize ourselves. So not just what is the best ad for us, but what's the best medication. Who is, are we the most like? So we can say, what can I expect next in my health uh, uh, trajectory? Come on, let's have some more questions there. I think you, uh, you undersold the, the firework. That's a, a pretty profound difference because for years we'd had all of these proposals for interoperability and this is one the day and all of the government programs for interoperability now run on the standard including it's tied to uh, CMS payment. That being said, how you mentioned that this is going to be open the door for other uh, genome phenome combination studies and how, how would that work? Great. So first of all, thank you for the compliment um, that you started with because um, getting data liberated has always been a hobby for me. And I remember, for those of you who are um, informa uh, medical informatics nerd, when we were doing this, people said, what, what, HL7, it's going to be interoperable. And I said, you have no idea what you're talking about. 
And so what we did is we, became, we created a very opinionated standard, not only using specific terminology and specific data structures, but a, a user guide, so you use it in, in a very specific way. And getting that done was a huge effort, and many people from the standards community told us not to do it. Uh, but, so thank you for the compliment. So how is it going to be done? So just to, uh, in, uh, oh, by the way, I should point out that uh, the, the uh, study I just showed you with uh, lipids appeared in Nature Medicine. Because I was reminded of that, because there's another Nature Medicine paper that just appeared um, in machine learning using Apple Watch to uh, diagnose um, ventricular dysfunction. And what they did is they recruited through social media a bunch of individuals who had an Apple Watch in uh, 22 countries, 2,000 individuals, and those same individuals uploaded their ECGs, their actual 12 lead ECGs. And they saw, can we I detect with the one lead measurement that you have from your Apple Watch, this is a Fitbit, not Apple Watch, but if you have an Apple Watch with the one lead uh, ECG from the Apple Watch, can you actually diagnose the uh, left ventricular dysfunction that is obvious on the 12 lead? And the short answer was yes, with AUCs that were pretty high. And so I think what's going to happen is that um, because of an act that just passed, not only uh, will you be, have access to your watch data, and not only to the LDL levels and to the medications, but you'll have the genomic sequence that's measured in the healthcare system. And so you'll be able to volunteer the data for studies. That's how I think it's going to happen. And it's going to be an interesting business because hospitals are not very good at doing those kinds of studies. And I'm, of course, I'm thrilled by it because the first thing that happens when you let hospitals do it is even within hospitals, a bunch of jealous doctors who then corner that market and the patients can't share data effectively. So this will create different, me different mechanisms, a lot of them going through public social media uh, mechanisms to recruit them. Yes? Talk. Is that good? Thank you. OK. And, uh, you made my night by knowing my mentor, Lou Holmes, and his research. So take that example you just gave on ventricular dysfunction. Yeah. And, you, and when I came up to you and said, we're only as young as our oldest part, yeah. you said, well, but the brain's the most important organ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we call it um, concurrent jurisdictions in law. Concurrent jurisdiction meaning the brain is supreme and it impacts. Yes. So take ventricular dysfunction. There's no parameters generally done by doctors. So if you have sleep disorder, yeah, that yeah. exacerbates your ventricular of dysfunction. Course. If you have an anxiety disorder, personality disorder, you have a history of drug use, if you have low IQ with low management, you have too high of IQ and you're arrogant and you're narcissistic. It's I'm talking about me. Right, uh, it's all modifiable. What did you say? I'm yeah. sorry, I don't hear that well. That's my oldest part right now. Yeah. So. Okay, so, um, absolutely right. And I didn't hear your phrase though. I really meant that. I didn't hear what you said back to me. No, no. So and everyone laughed I, I, and heard I, it. I made a stupid joke. I said, stop talking about me. Um, oh, okay. Um, but more seriously, um, your measurements at the hospital represent less than 1% of your life. We've finally come to accept that the blood pressure that is obtained once a year at a doctor's office is a meaning, meaningless representation of your uh, blood pressure. But that's true of a lot of things. Then that's why they need for a, example, home, for a home a medical home. system that attaches to you that gets more continuous readings. I mean, you can come up with parameters at every part of the body, the age of the pancreas. I mean, it's like George Church talks about it. I've been doing so it for 40 that, years. That's going to happen. And probably what's going to drive it is, there's for, especially for neurodegenerative diseases, there's a huge need for um, intermediary uh, markers. And so for just looking at, for example, gait and speech. We can, you can use your smartphone to actually measure in the frequency domain differences in gait, differences in speech that are actually very stratifying and show uh, trajectories in the uh, neurodegenerative disease. So I think the, if I'm, you know, unfortunately I always have to remind my grad students and my medical students about the, the fact that driving all of this is a big, very expensive healthcare system. And so finding different business models, like the pharmaceutical companies trying to do these trials, to actually do those studies to make the point is important. Yes? Thanks for the great talk. This was really interesting. I was curious uh, 
about your perspective on equity in all this data collection and healthcare has a history of a lot of issues there. How do you envision that going forward as more and more data gets collected? So let's just say it outright. It's very possible that like every new uh, development, this will increase in equity across the health system. That is certainly a possibility. Um, and why would it be? Because only those of us whose lives are organized enough so that we have an, a fixed address, who have a, fix, uh, a good uh, internet connection, will have all that data uh, coming together. True. On the other hand, back in the 1990s, I did a study where we were looking on pa following patients after their um, visit to the emergency room at Children's Hospital. And we were, wanted to contact the moms to make sure they would, and this was in, in late 1990s, very early in the web. And it was amazing to me that some of the most um, participatory mothers were in homeless shelters and had availed themselves of these uh, sources. But I will say it again, there's going to be inequity built in the system, especially a system that's a fee-for-service system as we currently are. So I don't think that this uniquely contributes to inequity, but it could further accelerate it. And, uh, but what's interesting, by the way, is that the world, at the world level, though, it might, it's almost certainly will, will <coughs> reduce inequity. Um, in COVID, for example, in India, I saw that they were using an API attached to the WhatsApp app to actually do data collection of labs that they were reading off of their own papers, paper lab measurements, and actually getting population views in India, just going skipping all the infrastructure that we have, electronic health records, and actually getting pretty current views of the epidemiology of COVID without this incredibly inefficient infrastructure that we have. So I think in some parts of the world, they're sort of skipping past the, weird, uh, the weirdness of the resistance in the, that we have in the circuit. But unfortunately, what you said also is true. Yes? Just going back to the um, genetics a little bit, you had these uh, certain comorbidity groups. And I could imagine that um, you might have a range of autism spectrum uh, phenotypes, if you will, within each of those groups that could be just a reflection of different um, severity of the, of the variants that are prevalent. Or I could imagine that you might have specific uh, you know, cognitive phenotypes. phenotypes. Exactly. And so I wondered if you had looked at that and, and what you found. So great question because it points out a limitation. So. I was not the first person to look at comorbidities in autism, but most of the early Simons researchers were looking at cognitive uh, um, comorbidities, like did this mutation have more of this aspect of autism, of this mutation, that aspect, or severity. It didn't map that well. For a few genes it did, but it didn't map very well. Um, whereas, because it turns out to be a human being who can sit upright and con converse with you autistically versus less autistically, that's pretty uh, similar human being physiologically. Whereas someone who has uh, diabetes, type 1 diabetes, very different physiology. And so it was easy for, easier for us to pick up these medical co uh, uh, comorbidities that people had previously not been looking for because we had access to the electronic health record, and it's cheap. The problem is with those cognitive, neuropsychiatric, precise measures, they're incredibly expensive. I think the Simons Foundation was spending thousands of dollars per patient for a new set neuro neuropsychiatric workup, whereas we were, it was you know, fractions of a cent per patient to uh, qu quantify their comorbidities. For that reason, even within the Simon Simplex collection, which is actually pretty big, it's not big enough to have the range that we need. So th that's the problem. Does that make sense?
the actual genetics that you found underlying those differences? That's a longer, that's maybe. And that's, that's, a, that's a long question. That's a question I'd love to have with you over coffee. Yes. Any effort underway to collect and analyze uh, like general population data to see the effects of all the medications and pharmaceuticals that people are on? And uh, I mean, all that information should be obtainable. I know that there are problems with secure, anonymizing it and getting it securely. And I'm sure the pharmaceutical industry wouldn't like you to know that their drugs that they're making billions of dollars on aren't helping hypertension or diabetes per se. But is there some effort to get that information which should be obtainable? So first of all, congratulations on being the first audience member who figured out how to press the button correctly to actually <laughs> get your voice amplified. Um, second of all, um, what? so right now in the United States, the best place to get those medication profiles are from insurance companies. And so one of my faculty, um, Paul Aviak, actually did that. And it, he published it in JAMA Pediatrics. And it's actually quite eye-opening for kids with autism because a lot of them are treated with major antipsychotics. Why? Not because they uh, fix them in any way. They calm them down. By the way, the saddest thing I want to tell you about the inflammatory bowel disease problem. Remember I said brain bad tummy hurt? A lot of these kids were bleeding in their gut and had pain. Now, if you're able to verbalize, say, mommy, my, my, my tummy hurts, these kids were doing what a kid with autism does, act out. And so what were they treating with them? With antipsychotics, which was not getting rid of the pain at all. It was just, so can you create, isn't that crazy? Uh, that's what this l lack of phenotypic uh, finesse does. So I began to answer your question. Let me just finish. Um, so that data is, in fact, there. And we should be using it more thoroughly. It's actually a great in some way, probe into, into the disease, and it's not being sufficiently uh, used. It's, I just have so many other students. I don't have that many students. I don't like to have a lot of grad students, so at least our group is kind of limited, but others will be able to do it. Any more uh, questions? Yes, you in the back. I was curious about um, more of the determination of the quality to, of the data that we're going to be collecting in the future, and how do we how are we able to manage it as more and more data comes in and be able to determine what it has co-founding factors, nocebo effects, placebo effects, and everything. So I think you're asking a question about data quality and how do we understand the data quality and how do we uh, make it better. Does that be the last question? Yes. OK. So great question. A lot of data is really crappy. And it's, it's crappy on the phenotypic end, but frankly, it's crappy on the genomic end. Um, those of us who looked at data on both sides know it is. But what's been true on both sides is the more you use the data, the better the data gets. So for example, if clinicians know that you're actually using the data, and it's not just being used for billing, they actually become better annotators of the data. Also, um, going back to my, my PhD areas and where I spend most of my work, time these days working in artificial intelligence, I actually believe that good natural language processing on the actual textual record is actually much more specific and sensitive for a lot of the neurodevelopmental dis disorders. We did a very nice study looking at major depression resistant to multiple SSRIs using the textual record, using uh, machine learning and NLP techniques. So I think using the data more, you know, bringing data to the light of day and analysts, and then giving feedback to the de data generators is what creates a virtuous cycle of improving. And with that, thank you very much. Thanks for your attention.